booktube it's Zina from beating around the books i'm here to do my second half of october wrap up um this might be rather uh vague because well i tend not to have a very good memory of books generally and this month i seem to be even worse but anyway Let's just start with what I can remember. Um, first off, a DNF, unfortunately. Um, actually, there were two DNFs. So one was M Train by Patti Smith. Now, this is not a proper DNF, to be honest. Um, this I meant to read uh, to buddy read this with Bert from Pastory Time, and um, I feel really bad for like bailing on him. Um, the problem was that I just could not get into her writing style in that moment. Um, I've only got into like two oops two chapters or so. That's where we're losing a um, bookmark. Anyway, um, and I was incredibly tired most of the time, so I had to really limit the physical books that I was reading because I just didn't have enough energy to keep my eyes open. That sounds terrible. It's not down to this book necessarily. Um, but yeah, I ended up just not feeling in the mood for this. So I think it might be might well be a book that I'm going to pick up at a later time. Maybe it's just not the right time then. Um, but, but finished it I think and he really enjoyed it so at least you know at least one of us got to read it and liked it. The second book I DNF was a proper DNF um, it was The Woman in the Purple Skirt by Natsuko Imamura which uh, was translated from the Japanese by Lucy North. Um, this was really weird <laughs> um, it's about a woman who is obsessed with the woman in the purple skirt. The woman who is obsessed with her is the woman in the yellow cardigan or something like that. So nobody's named properly. And she seems to be somehow stalking that other woman to an extent. Um, and, you know, like basically observing her every move and <sighs> trying to guess, you not know, trying to like puzzle out this enigma that this woman in the purple skirt is um, and it's I don't know I don't know what am I supposed to say about this I read no I, I listened to it on script I listened to almost half of it I think and it just couldn't really hold my attention it was one of those right where it's like you get you leave it going on and on because you're doing other things like you do sometimes with audiobooks and then when I reached the halfway mark I just sort of went no this is yeah no I'd rather listen to something else I can't tell you why exactly it just wasn't it wasn't holding my attention anyway so these are the two DNFs or one proper DNF the other one put down for now um, and then apart from that I had the loveliest group buddy read of uh, W.G. Seabald's um, Austerlitz. Um, I read this in German, the others read it in English. Um, this was a four-way buddy read between uh, Mark Nash, Courtney Ferreter and Brian from Bookish and Me and it was wonderful. Um, <laughs> I dare say I benefited more from their thoughts than I personally contributed because I was also lagging behind on this one a little bit. See me being too tired to read very much. Um, but it was it was just brilliant. Um, this is my first Seabold and um, I remember starting the first quarter, so we read it in quarters, right? Um, and thinking, wow, I'm not actually interested in most of most of what is going on in here. Like, you know, the, the content of the first quarter. I'm not interested in it at all, but somehow this is easy, this is so easily readable and it's really sort of just carrying me along uh, because of the prose. Um, and it was just really enjoyable 
regardless of the content, which is rather weird. Um, but I will also say that the content gets much more interesting and compelling, you know, later down the line. So it's, yeah, it's, it's wonderful on all levels. Um, I wouldn't say it's for everyone, but um, yeah. Seabold is one of those writers, like there's these ridiculously long sentences. Not all of them are ridiculous, but he, he's, he's very fond of the long sentence um, and one it, which is particularly striking I think went over 11 pages in my version which is one where I really noticed it and I literally went through the pages to see because it had a really um, strong effect on me and to me it made sense in the context of what you know what what was being talked about um, so you know how do you say this, like form and function, no, form and function, is it? <laughs> is it form and function that go together or is it form and content? Sorry, can't speak today. Anyway, so um, it was great, but I could see how it's not for everyone. Sorry, I was just interrupted by my husband coming back. Okay, so back to Austerlitz. So what is this about? <laughs> um, our protagonist is named Jack Austerlitz. Uh, I'm pointing at this guy, but that isn't actually him, although we're meant to think it is. Um, and he is a man in search of his own history and his identity, I guess, um, who was sent over to the UK in 1939 as one of the people, you know, one of the uh, children who was sent over in the Kindertransport um, from Prague because he was, uh, he's, he was Jewish and he got um, sent to this sort of, what's it, uh, sort of religious, uh, well, very Christian um, couple who changed his name and who never spoke to him about his past um, and so by the time he is like about to graduate from school he uh, doesn't really remember any of it um, he's just got these very vague vague memories of something you know something being different before that but he doesn't even remember his old name um, and that gets revealed to him by the headmaster in the school because he's about to take his final exams I think and the headmaster tells him in order to be able to be eligible for a university you know to, to, to get in you have to use your real name which is Jack Austerlitz and so that's sort of the first clue he gets that you know a lot of his past is completely in the dark um, and we get to hear his story told through another narrator's eyes so he is somehow um, he knows Austerlitz somehow um, he meets him sporadically um, and Austerlitz tells him about his life story um, First, you know, it, it kind of begins with the sort of time that he spent at this Christian um, pastor's house. Um, and then it just sort of continues chronologically. And we then at some point also learn about his quest to find out about his past. Um, and, oh God, what... <laughs> What else do I say? So like I said, the um, prose is really, no, I didn't say that in that way. It's very dreamlike. Um, like I said, he's, he's, he's really into very long sentences, but they don't seem belabored, at least not to me. And the, um, the dreamlike quality, I think, um, makes a lot of sense in this context because Austerlitz is in search of memories um, 
and we can also you know and sometimes these memories well first of all a lot of the memories just won't surface for him even when he's really really trying incredibly hard to you know like manifest them um a lot of times then i think he's trying to somehow create a memory almost from from what is what he's being told um by others um and so there's this overlay of what is actually his memory and then what is the stuff that he is either like superimposing onto it from either what he's being told or what he's imagining things might look like um, and so on. So I, to me that works really well with this, with the prose. Um, and um, oh god, <laughs> this is so difficult. <laughs> so he's on this quest, right, and he goes um, He goes to different places that within Europe that are well that had um, a Jewish population before before the Holocaust, and um, one of them is Prague, where obviously he had lived beforehand. Um, and um, there's this whole story about you know, what he'd learned about Theresienstadt, the, the Jewish ghetto um, there, and how he's trying to imagine life as it could have been and, 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 and how his mother was there and, you know, and he wonders, oh, what happened? Like, did she, did she end up being there for so and so long or not? And da, 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 but he can't find out. Um, and that Theresienstadt part is also the part that has that incredibly long sentence, which uh, was absolutely perfect in my mind, um, because it was really, it kind of let, let um, how do you say this, it led the, me as a reader to be, to feel really breathless, um, which I think sort of underlined the, the relentlessness of the brutality of the Nazis, you know, in how they exploited um, people and you know ultimately destroyed them of course um, and yeah it's it's in those parts it's incredibly touching and it even made me feel physically sick sometimes even though it's not very um, graphic in any way it's just um, yeah the prose is very evocative I guess um, There's so much to discuss in here, so many symbols that he comes back to, you know, like images that are sort of hinted at in the beginning and then we come back to them as well as ideas about time um, and I guess, you know, some th uh, things, objects being outside of time and how objects or also buildings are sort of the last um, the last remnants of history um, when people are long gone and the <laughs> on the unreliability of memory um, And I guess, I think that was what Courtney Ferret had mentioned, um, the importance of bearing witness. Um, yeah, I've gone very thoughtful and off on a tangent. So I'm going to stop it here, even though there's plenty more to say, but I urge you to watch the other people's um, <clears throat> videos on it, who may well be much more coherent than me. Um, it was five stars for me, so that's that. Um, the other books I finished. I listened to Hysteria by Jessica Gross, which is a weird one. It is 
definitely one of those novels that fits into this sort of category I like to call disaster women. You know, think uh, Otessa Moschweg's My Year of Rest and Relaxation or what's her name? Don't know who, well, anyway, what was it? <sighs> Melissa Broder's Milk Fed or Raven Leilani's Luster. Um, but I think it's slightly weirder than the other the other ones that I've mentioned. Um, so there's this obviously this young woman is the protagonist. I talk about disaster women, right? Who doesn't really know doesn't really know about her place in the world and you know how to deal with some trauma that she's experienced and it, yeah in her case it's uh, yeah like childhood trauma I guess um sort of unresolved mm, issues with her parents I guess anyway and she is addicted to sex and or masturbation and she uh, talks about this quite a lot and she loves to you know hook up with random people at parties and also uh, people who are much older than her um, and she ends up basically obsessing over this guy who is a new bartender in the in one of the bars that she goes to of course yeah she also drinks a lot no surprises here i'm not sure if she takes drugs i can't remember anymore but anyway probably um so she gets really obsessed over this guy who works in a bar and she gets absolutely convinced that that guy is sigmund freud i don't know weird right um, because she had um, she had this early encounter with Freud, I mean early encounter with his work, a book and had his uh, you know his portrait or whatever on it and she got really obsessed over that as well. Her parents are both psychotherapists by the way or psychologists, I don't know what kind. Um, and she gets yeah she gets into her head that the bar guy is Sigmund Freud and then she obsesses over him obviously wants to sleep with him um, and then things happen from there and she talks to him in this very Freudian manner about her hang-ups and we go from there and you know things may or may not be true because she's clearly not a very reliable person um, I can't remember how many point how many stars I gave it probably three it was kind of you know I think I could really admire how frank it was and how out there it was but at the same time it was not as good as the other disaster women novels I've mentioned um so I don't I don't I do think it's kind of missable to be honest <laughs> But it was, you know, it was entertaining enough for that, you know, for the time being. Um, so that's that. Um, and then I listened to a an audiobook arc that I got on NetGalley, uh, which confused me because um, the book seems to have been published, I think, two or three years ago. Um, yes, in 2018. But I guess maybe the um, maybe the audiobook is new. I don't know. It well, you know, it was on NetGalley. I listened to it. It is The Descent of Annie Lang by Ross Franey. Or Franey? I don't know. Franey, I think. And um, this is very straight up historical fiction with a hint of mystery can call it that i'm not sure i'm not usually a mystery reader but there is some sort of mystery to unveil i guess um now um i used to really love historical fiction but i haven't um read much in the recent past uh but i think this one does what it wants to do really well um so 
we have a woman protagonist, Annie Lang. She is, um, it's, it's a sort of dual timeline narrative. Um, so I think we, we meet her as a young um, woman, I wouldn't know how old, it's, she's probably only 17 or 18 at the time, you know what I mean, she's, this is a different time, I don't actually remember what time it's set in, that's lovely isn't it? So we meet her as a young adult, I guess, at those, in those times anyway, nowadays maybe she would still be considered, you know, a minor, but anyway. Um, and she has come home from an extended stay in France um, to study. And she's come home to find out that her brother has been put into an asylum um, because he's got some sort of mental health problem. And she doesn't know what's up with that, um, but she's suspicious. And the other timeline is about her as a younger child. Um, and it is uh, framed as diary entries from her. Um, so I know lots of people hate child narrators. I don't have such a problem with it. And I thought actually that it worked quite well, apart from maybe a few instances where I felt like, okay, the wording doesn't really fit this, you know, this age. But anyway, it was fine. So she grows up in this very, very strict religious family. Um, and I don't think it's a spoiler at all. Her mother dies when she's a very little kid. And then, you know, over time, her dad decides to take another wife. And it kind of very simply follows that stereotype of the evil stepmother, I guess, to an extent. She is incredibly, um, like, you know, I would say it's like a devout Christian um, and very sort of harsh with the children and yeah so she does she makes life quite horrible for them um, and Annie is sort of struggles with her faith already from an early age because you know she doesn't understand like what if she is told that Jesus loves all the children why on earth did her mother die when you know when she was still a kid, when all she wanted was to keep her mother and all that sort of thing. And that leads to her questioning other things and uh, being a bit difficult. Um, because she doesn't just eat up everything that she's being told um, to believe. Um, and yeah, so, so we hear about her and then we jump back and forth between these two timelines um, and, you know, we end up obviously wanting to figure out what happened to her brother. Why is he in this um, asylum? And um, other things happen. I don't want to talk about more than that because I think that would be too spoilery anyway. Um, it was quite engrossing, even though I don't think it does anything particularly original in that sense. Um, I did like, I like the idea of her, you know, I guess to an extent, hmm, developing to, you know, become a person that um, rejects the narratives that she's being told um, and, you know, questioning things. Um, what I mean is it, it doesn't do anything outside of the box. And, but I don't think that's what you should expect when you read a book like that. Therefore, I gave it four stars. This is where I get this difficulty about, you know, rating books because I was like, well, it doesn't give me anything like super original to think about, but what it says it will do, it does really well. So therefore, four stars, even though it's very different four stars from another book I might read. Does that make sense? I hope it makes sense. Makes sense in my mind. So if you're into historical fiction and you don't mind a child narrator, I can recommend it. Then I finished my first nonfiction November um, title of the month. Well, I mean, I started in October 
I finished it in, I don't know, on the 2nd of November, but I'm gonna call it, I'm gonna add it to my October wrap up because why not? I listened to the majority of it in October. So, and that was Patrick Radden Keefe's Empire of Pain, um, the secret history of the Sackler dynasty. So this um, chronicles sort of, I think at least three generations of the Sackler family um, who were very well known as, a, um, what do you call that? Uh, philanthropists who were donating vast uh, vast amounts of money to several sort of museums art galleries um, science wings of uh, prestigious universities and so on and so forth um, but this book uh, chronicles <clears throat> the development of you know like I guess how, how they came to their riches um, how you know and um, that is Inextric inextricably linked to the opioid crisis. Um, and let me tell you, this is this is a very long audiobook I listen to here. Um, I think the print version has over 500 pages. Um, and while there are very few bits where I thought, wow, okay, this is very detailed, um, which, you know, is not negative in that sense, because it's seems very well researched um most of this reads like some film like you know like the the mafia paired with some political uh, uh, uh not conspiracy but you know the sort of you know how do you say this like backroom machinations um with high-powered politicians and so on um it's quite incredible, let's put it that way. Um, the ambition, the greed, the um, absolute ruthlessness of some of them, and also the sort of delusion that some of these people seem to have had about their role in this. It's incredible, really, really well written as well. Um, I can definitely recommend it and I know that this one is has been all over booktube anyway and that it's probably high on the list of a lot of people who are doing non-fiction November but if you hadn't decided yet give it a go <laughs> um, it was a five star one for me um, and it's making me very excited to at some point get to say nothing which was his previous book about the troubles um, which I have bought a copy of, um, but it somehow got lost somewhere in my in-laws house. So maybe I'll have to make another effort to find it. Um, yeah, I think that is all I read. There's another one that I also started in October, finished in November, but I guess I'm gonna leave it at that because this is long enough. Um, other things that I started and didn't finish, but I'm still very much wanting to finish is Severance by Ling Ma. I said other things, but I think this is the only one. Um, I'm probably two thirds into it, so I should be finishing it by end of the weekend, hopefully. And I guess it will be part of a new uh, wrap up video. Although I'm considering doing um, weekly reads from now on, because this seems too long, doesn't it? There's like six books to talk about or whatever, you know, it depends, but maybe I'll do a weekly one. We'll see. Let me know if you've read any of these and how you felt about them. And um, if you've read more Seabold, where should I go from here? Okay, thanks very much. Have a lovely day. Bye bye.